Hi, I'm Deandra, and this is the Daddy Recovery Sessions, Episode 3, Filler Energy. <laughs> I forgot the title. Let's begin this audiobook, shall we? My father understood that people have a relationship with titles, and that was the art of his ability to not only calm them, but even have them forgive him. For instance, he knew how badly I wanted a dad, and for that reason, he understood no matter how abusive he became, I would just, at best, want to talk about it. For so long, I craved a father, even if only in title, that I was able to dismiss every action he committed against his child, me, that was so unfatherly. When I asked my father to recommend me to his alma mater law school, like he did with his other children, he said, no, I have to earn it. This after years of saying he would. By age five, my father said it was time I started calling him, especially if I wanted him to visit. Only then would he drop everything to see me. I remember calling him so much just in a day and finding many wasted weekends of waking up early because he said he would come. Ultimately, he would end up calling my mom to cancel at night. He knew I was there all day waiting and held no honor to my child heart. Yet I would wait every time for a daddy day and when it did happen would leave me in anxiety and shameful tears over some aspect of my body and personality he deemed putrid. It is a trained behavior that I have carried in a lot of my relationships. A high tolerance for abandonment, sabotage, and verbal abuse if my partner calls it love. When I look back at so many of my friendships and exes, I feel I'm using the word with an emptiness. These people did nothing to love, hold, or even protect me, but I called them friends and lovers and would do so for years. Some of them even lied, gossiped, and sabotaged opportunities for me, and I stayed, giving them an unconditional, unwavering loyalty they did not deserve because I was trained to just stay. It was only until a dinner with Yali, who was my soul twin, that I was confronted for my emotional looseness. Deandra, I'm kind of hurt she blurted as she poured me a glass of Prosecco, our preferred drink when we wanted to have fun but felt slightly dehydrated and depressed. You do not text me for my birthday. That really mattered to me. You know this has been a year of loss for me. Yali, like so many of my friends, was going through a divorce while I was going through a depression. Despite not seeing my father for years, I thought a decade without me being in his life would make him see my value and his abuse only to find he was fine and oddly relieved without me and not apologetic. The realization had spiraled me to lose all sense of time and self, which meant missing Yali's B-Day. I'm sorry, I said shamefully. I have been so sad and selfish. Yet it is what followed that was a curious note even to me. My father's official exit from my life had me end so many super superfluous relationships where once again I was the fun one entertaining some toxic people. All my other friends, we don't message each other, I said. While this sounds like a basic, even made-up excuse, the problem is that it was true and a major red flag on how I run relationships. Yali was one of the first people in my life that made me feel like how I love others, and I met her in my mid-twenties. We both love music festivals and have a strange dynamic when it comes to directions. Yali always knows them, and people seem to think I do. A group of frat bros and their girlfriends asked me where a certain artist and stage was located. Despite having no clue, I boldly gave them directions, of which she, overhearing, corrected me. Yet if there's one thing I am when it comes to directions, is boldly confident that even when I guide you wrong, you will find your way. Thus, knowing I had no clue, I corrected her and sounded so convincing the group followed my orders. She shrugged, and after thinking about it, I realized she was right. Thus, I proceeded to follow her, and that moment is a pretty solid example of the heart of our relationship. I know, but that is not an, ex not an excuse. Like, it hurt me, she said with her eyes watering. I know when you get sad, you disappear and you come back like nothing, and I do that too, but it was a detail that mattered to me. I needed that. The guilt surged into my face 
and my yappy usual self had nothing else to say but sorry. No excuses. Our friendship has been so wonderful and healing to me that I mark it as more special than most, even familial, and helpful in seeing that many of the people in my life were fillers, human bodies holding the space of titles they never earned or honored. My dad being the biggest filler of all, an enemy obsessed with making me feel that our shared blood wiped away his constant degrading of me. It was such a superficial excuse that in perspective worked because like my own excuse with Yali, we were convinced by them, especially as reasons for why we failed to show up. Sure, Yali was not my child and I was not yelling at her to death in every mall within the tri-state area like my dad loved to do. Yet I failed to show up and genuinely thought my feelings, especially on how others hurt me, absolved or aptly explained why I'd hurt her. I was ashamed and it inspired me to further do daddy recovery because here was a good friend, one I prayed for and still pray to meet others like, and I was acting like I was a filler, someone with the title of bestie, but unwilling to earn or honor it. So let's do a little bit of uh, after ep. So I, I call filler energy, basically in my head when I was trying to pick a title and describe it, I did a lot of theater and um, we would call fillers the people that would stay on the, the spots of where a character is supposed to be during a scene when that actor didn't show up or they couldn't show up that day. So like we would get somebody in the crew or maybe their sub and they would play the role or at least they would fill the space even though they weren't the actor and the character. And that's something that I felt with my dad throughout a relationship. He was a very filler energy. Like he got the title of dad and he would stand in the spot, but he didn't have the talent or that he didn't actually play the role. He was just there filling the spot. And it's something that I noticed after, you know, our final meeting and how heartbreaking it was to see that he was fine that he recognized he did harm, but thought more I should move on than actually say sorry. And that absolutely broke me. That sunk me into about a years long depression that I'm starting to get out of now. And just like not that long ago, I met with Yali and um, she immediately, and I might cry saying this, said, you know, you missed my birthday. And she had been having such a bad year as well. And we are both two people that when we get depressed, we kind of like disappear. You know, sending an email or text is incredibly emotionally hard for us. And we both have always understood that for e about each other. But I don't think we had as much a hard year, her going through a divorce, me going through this like daddy divorce in some ways as we did this year. And I, she would send me a few messages. I would send her a few messages. We were never fully disconnected, but we were gone from each other. And I can only imagine, and I say this as somebody who struggles with depression, it's funny how you don't show up for people, but you do look to see if somebody messages you on your birthday. Who sends me Merry Christmas? And it feeds your your ego and, and your sadness when nobody does because your ego's like, oh, of course they didn't. You're horrible. You're lonely. Nobody cares. And to think I triggered that in Yali really devastated me. And it made me kind of check myself because one of my worst fears with my father and my daddy issues is that in his head, nobody felt as much pain as he did. Nobody had such a horrible childhood. Nobody's had such horrible poverty. Nobody had such horrible insecurities. It's like he was the worst person or had the worst experiences to oddly be doing well and oddly be replicating them via his other relationships. And it was very hard to confront him on the harm he was causing me. And I felt like at that moment with Yali, like I had to really humble myself and not kind of follow in his footsteps that if you act like you're in more pain 
or if you think your pain is the end all be all, you're really going to dismiss how the people that do show up for you and do love you, um, you have failed them and you need to make up for it and you need to apologize if they really matter to you. And that's something that because my dad never said sorry, I knew I didn't matter to him. And that alone could be my eternal excuse for why I don't show people that do matter to me that they do. So yeah, that's filler energy and check out, uh, please read it on daddyrecovery.com and follow me on, uh, TikTok at Daddy Recovery so you could see me and see my videos and yeah let's take this healing journey together and follow me on all music platforms as Deandra all right